Bonjour à toutes et tous. Euh, euh, je vais parler plutôt en anglais puisque tous les autres intervenants sont anglophones, ça sera plus, plus fluide. Donc, euh, euh, comme vous savez, vous avez une traduction simultanée possible. So I'll continue, I'll switch to English and, and we can uh, continue in English. When I arrived in China in the year of 2000 as a correspondent, uh, I was told that if I needed information about the Uyghurs and, and the situation in Xinjiang, there was a man, an academic, uh, an economist, uh, who was uh, uh, very uh, knowledgeable, very uh, open, very moderate. He was advocating uh, non-violence. He was advocating cohabitation between uh, the Han Chinese and the Uyghurs. And this man was Ilham Toti. And, um, and he's someone I've been following all these years, and I must say it's with a lot of shock that I heard that he had been sentenced to life imprisonment for subversion, which is exactly the opposite of everything I had heard about him, and I had seen him a couple of times during my years in, in China. So it's uh, very moving uh, tonight to see on screen uh, not only Uh, his own words in, in the videos from, uh, uh, from the past, but also uh, his daughter. And I think she should be uh, on screen somewhere. Yes! <laughs> Hello, Joar. Can you hear us well? Hello. Hello. Oh, very yes, good. I can hear you all. Okay, thank you very much. So I'm very happy and honored to have you uh, in front of me, uh, if I could say so, uh, on screen, um, as I had heard about your father so much, uh, almost you know, more than 20 years ago. And I'm also very happy and, and honored to have with us another of the characters of, uh, of the film, uh, Uh, Abdul Weli Ayoub, uh, next to me. Uh, welcome. <laughs> so you're a poet and linguist, and, and now an expert in, in uh, Norwegian uh, language and history. <laughs> <laughs> next to you, Sarah Brooks, uh, head of the China program at Amnesty International. Welcome. And the author of the film, David Novak. <laughs> Congratulations for uh, quite a remarkable insight into this huge but totally undercovered uh, problem of fa the fate of the Uyghurs in the past few years and the camps and the, and the persecution of these people. I mean, when, when you look at the film, and I'm, I must say I'm, this is part of my work to be concentrated on the issues around China, Um, and when I looked at the film, I realized how much I didn't know and how much uh, is being hidden uh, or undercovered or unknown from, from us. But I'll start with you, uh, Juhar, uh, maybe. Uh, the last words we saw on the screen was that the whereabouts of your father were, st were unknown. Is it still the case? And, and when was the last time you had indirect uh, news from him from, from prison? The very last time anyone has had a word of my father and had met with my father was 2017. And um, since then, no one was able to visit him uh, nor speak with him. And sorry, I'm hearing myself a feedback, uh, getting distracted. Um, Um, a few weeks ago, the Chinese police visited my home in Beijing and um, and uh, interrogated uh, my my family and said that Jahar Ilham should stop because she worked for her father, and that her that she should stop telling people that he cannot be visited, which it's the fact. Um, and um, the police, the Chinese state security informed my family that now if my family would like to visit my father 
then they can. However, we do not know if it's the truth because since the past few years, the Chinese government had always claimed that my father had have had the visiting rights, although when my family is there, they don't allow him to be visited. So we're hoping we're hoping that we can restore a visit this summer uh, because of the advocacy work that we've been doing. Um, and uh, we hope uh, what the Chinese government told us recently uh, was true and that he is alive. Um, that's my biggest hope at the moment. And um, but yeah, since 2017, no one had heard a word of my one had visited my father um, for a very long time. We didn't know if he was alive, um, but we do hope to find out this summer. And, and do you have any idea in which prison he's being detained? Did you hear me? Oh, it's, it seems to be frozen. Um, when my father was put in prison, he was put in. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, when my father was first put in prison, he was put in Urumqi Number One Prison, the Urumqi First Prison. Uh, we do not know if he has been transferred. Uh, we do not know if he has been put in a re-education center or another prison or in forced labor, we do not know. We will have to find out this summer, but the last information we got was he was locked up in Urumqi First Prison. We saw in the film that he, he was telling uh, that he thought he would be sentenced to 10 years, maybe 20 years, but even that he felt was uh, the go Chinese government was not that uh, harsh. Uh, and he got life sentence. Why, why do you think they, they made such a case about him back then because that, that's that's 2014, that's 10 years ago. Well, I believe there are many reasons. Well, first of all, I'm not a Chinese official member, so I cannot really predict what exactly they were thinking. But I did believe my father was the start of a uh, bigger uh, crackdown on the entire Uyghur region, on the entire population. It was a start and it was a warning sign, I believe. And many, indeed, many Uyghurs left China uh, because of seeing that sign. And when a peaceful scholar like my father was put in prison, even though he had said nothing wrong, committed no crime, he was put in prison. And many scholars leaving, even one of the uh, characters in the film as well, Tahir Hamoud, he left uh, China because he saw my father, a scholar like him, peaceful scholar like him, was put in prison. So um, we, we also... Uh, as you know, that the uh, new chairman, uh, I mean, chairman of China, current chairman of China, came in power uh, just, you know, very shortly before my father put him in prison. So I believe it was a sign of a systematic change of China in a political uh, way. And uh, they were changing their entire political approach uh, and their tools uh, over over how they would like to proceed in the Uyghur region, which is striking hard and controlling, gain control, full control of the entire region and eliminate any individuals or groups uh, that have any possibility of having different opinions or could possibly challenge the authorities' um, power. So, and my father was a symbolic, uh, easy target um, because he was really waking the Uyghur uh, young generation up and making Uyghurs want to learn about their history, their people even more, and want to be able to help the development of the Uyghur homeland. And, um, and, and, and my father was not only waking up the Uyghur people, but also uh, he was welded internationally. He was, uh, you know, as you know, you you you, you just mentioned that you have learned about my father's work since many years ago. And so are many scholars around the world, many nonprofit organizations, NGOs, uh, and uh, government officials have learned the existence of Ilham Tohti and have really agreed with his approach. And that was so threatening for the Chinese government because the Chinese government does not want to solve problems or have peace. They only want full control and full assimilation uh, of the Uyghur nation, of the Uyghur population. On, on a personal level, we, we heard you say in the film that you, you wanted to have a normal life and uh, as a normal girl and, and that you, you felt you had to 
to enter politics, as you, as you said. How, how do you cope with that? What do you see today as your mission? Um, so I grew up wanting to be a dancer and I wanted to be in art and I still love it, Good, but actually. I do not have any spare time for it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I'm not very good anymore. Uh, I can barely spin and not feel dizzy. Uh, but um, I've been 19 years of my life being trained to be hoping to become a professional dancer. But now I am a human rights advocacy work is just my uh, side that what I dedicated my free time to. But my daytime job, I'm a labor rights uh, researcher. So I would do supply chain data to figure out which companies, uh, international companies are complicit in labor force labor and in, um, in, 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 in whether it's talking about China or they're collaborating with other countries to, to source forced labor tainted goods. So do I enjoy it? Not really. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there are people who love uh, staring at data, but not me. And uh, I do hope to have a chance one day to return to my passion. But just like many Uyghur people had to give up on their passion. And um, many people, um, I'm, I'm sh I personally know so many, uh, you know, talented uh, Uyghur individuals who had to give up on their life path, their career path choose to be in politics, to be in advocacy field. Why? Because we have to, and we don't have the choice. And the Chinese government had us two paths, which is turn our blind eye, pretend like nothing happened, and go on with our lives, and forget about the sufferings of our people or our family members. Or we have to give up our passion, our normal lives, and the the family bonding time with our where with our loved ones that are with us but instead spending all the free time or all the time just to focus on you know advocating for the disappeared uh friends families or people who you have probably never met but we share the bond as we're all people we're all Turks so we did not we did not make this choice the Chinese government forced to make us to have this choice and I do hope one day, you know, the more help we get from international communities, the faster we can end this atrocity and the faster Uyghur people can gain back, you know, go back to their passion and Uyghur people inside the Uyghur region, whether they're medical doctors or soccer players or singers who have been forced to left, let, leave their passion and now is working in forced labor uh, factories. Hopefully, we can all go back to our loved passions and we can go back to our uh, normal lives. Thank you. We'll come back to, to the, the labor issues uh, later in the debate. Uh, David, I want to come to you. And, and uh, what, what is striking in the film is, is how uh, people dare to speak, despite the fact that uh, there is a lot of pressure for those who have family there. I mean, uh, Joar just mentioned the, that, that police went to her family and complained about, about her. Uh, so w was that one of the big issues about making this film, is, is the, the security and, and, and the possibility for people to speak openly about their history? Yes, uh, thank you for that question. And bef before I answer, thank you everybody for being here. It really warms all of us filmmakers here at the festival to see full audiences. So thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, yes and no. Uh, yes, in that um, the number of people who feel comfortable in the diaspora to speak about their experiences and their family experiences is very limited because th there are many more Uyghurs who are afraid to talk, and, and Kazakhs as well. This applies to many ethnic Kazakhs as well, and some other uh, Turkic ethnic groups uh, in the Uyghur region. And um, so to that extent, there's a, there's a small course of people who are willing to speak out. I'm not the only journalist or filmmaker who has reached those people. Uh, you can see some of the people in the film in, in other media as well. Um, one of the big differences was that with Abdueli as our guide in, in Turkey in particular, um, he took us to people who, who were speaking, many of them for the first time, um, many more than you see in the film. Uh, likewise with Kazakhs who are not in this shorter version of the film, but in the longer version, there are many, many Kazakhs who came out of the woodwork to speak in Kazakhstan. Um, about 40 people uh, sat before our cameras. Um, 
So, so it's sort of a, a double edge because those who are willing to speak are out and they're easy to, they're easy to find uh, at this point. Um, it always comes with risk and we always made sure even after we completed the film, before we put it out there, we double checked with everybody who we had interviewed to make sure that they still felt sometimes two or three years later that they feel still felt they still felt comfortable um, being in the film. Um, no one had changed their mind, actually. Uh, but many of them had received phone calls, um, suspicious phone calls, phone calls inviting them back to the region, um, phone calls about their family, giving not very much information, but just sort of, you know, that, that we have an eye on you kind of phone call. Um, and for me personally, uh, as well, um, I haven't felt particularly threatened. Um, I understand the risks of maybe my data being swiped and things like that. Um, we did communicate with everybody who participated in the film in front of and behind the camera using encrypted platforms, of course. Um, and when we were filming in Kazakhstan, we were followed. Um, and that was it, was, it was scary more to our host in the region, um, in Kazakhstan, who is a Kazakh human rights worker um, and a lawyer. Uh, and, but I can't say as maybe, maybe a little arrogance having an American passport, I kind of felt like mm, I might get stopped, I might get harassed, but nothing really is going to happen to me personally. What was your starting point where, how did you dig into the, the, the Uyghur story and, and decide to make, a, make it into a, a big film? Yeah, well, the, the starting point was really Johar. <laughs> um, through our, our friend Yashwe Kao, who, um, who runs a, a, a platform, website, and, and blog um, out of the US uh, called China Change, and um, she, she knows Johar very closely. And I was with her filming in, in Berlin about another kind of a China story. And she started telling me about Johar's story and about Ilian Toti, who I had not known about yet. Um, and so Johar welcomed us to Indiana to meet with her and interview her and hear the story. But it became very clear at that point that this was a really big story. This is a lot of people. And at the time, this was 2018, it was just when all of the news about, about the re-education camps was coming out. Um, and as um, as a Jew uh, of Eastern European descent, uh, having my family having lived the experience of concentration camps, it became very clear to me that this, um, this subject matter maybe didn't fall into my lap by coincidence, and I felt extremely compelled um, to tell the story and, 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 and to get to as many people as I could um, so that people could begin to understand the scale. Because when we're talking about you know, a million and a half, two million people going through this camp system. We don't know how many people are in forced labor at this point. We don't know how many people have died through all of this. Um, the number is large, I'm sure, but we don't know what that number is. Um, it's, it's astounding. And then if we look at the other 10 million people on top of that who are living in a surveillance state that's horrific, um, all with missing family members, um, it's it's a huge crisis. Thank you, uh, Abdulili. We we uh, you are, uh, started talking about it, but um, you 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 are in the film teaching uh, Uyghur language, Uyghur identity, as you said. What what do you think is the 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 aim of the Chinese government? Is it the eradication of Uyghur culture, uh, forced assimilation, as you are? said, is it uh, um, a question of, of having just one identity for the whole of China from Beijing to Kashgar? Um, like, um, it's uh, both. <laughs> like, um, uh, when we talk about the genocide, we always uh, hear something that there is no killing, there is no mass killing, there is no bombing, something like that. And people always compare, and let, let's be fr frank, Pe people always, Chinese government always compared it with the Gaza. Like always we can see from Twitter that they uh, post the picture of uh, Gaza, the city, 
And then under the, under the second one is Urumqi. They said, how beautiful Urumqi is and how like uh, disaster in Gaza. But the problem is, like, uh, yes, there is no mass killing. They haven't seen. But the problem is the heart. People's heart being died. That's the problem. It's really a hard process because you have to see everything every day. Like people die once at the war. But in the camp, people die every day. That's the difference. Because I have, exp I have experienced that 428 days, you die every day. That's what Chinese government is doing for up to 3 million Uyghurs in concentration camp. That's assimilation, yes. Like, they want you to become Chinese in the period of the camp. And also, outside of the camp, what they are doing is just they send the kids from kindergarten, the boarding school, eliminate their identity. They can't even live with their parents if their parents are outside. If their parents are inside, they have to stay there 365 days. If parents are outside, they have to stay like um, one week, like every, every week, only one day, they, the kids stay at home. Other time, they have to stay in the kindergarten 24 hours. This is like, uh, yeah, like um, one identity, Chinese identity, and one ideology, the Chinese communist nationalist ideology, and one nation, Chinese nation. There's no room for other nations, like Uyghurness or Tibetness or Mongolness. The 420 days you mentioned is the time you spent in yes. prison. And, and did you feel that you were being forced to abandon your original culture? Is that what they were trying to get out of you? Yes, uh, for example, let me ma mention one that like, uh, what, who is the closest uh, sibling of Uyghurs? It's really uh, nonsense concept. We ha you have to say Chinese. Han Chinese, our closest siblings, it's not. And then like, you have to say that like, are you Muslim or not? You have to say, I'm not. You have to say every day. And every morning you have to repeat that, I am criminal, I'm separatist, I'm here because of I have ideological diseases, and I have to correct my ideology. You have to say this. And you have to repeat every day, uh, from 8 o'clock to 8.45, and it's every day. And after the meal, before the meal, you have to praise Chinese Communist Party and Socialist State and Xi Jinping. Yeah. Um, Sarah, the, the, there was uh, some information in the past few months that uh, the, the pressure about the camps uh, had been lowering, that some people had been uh, uh, released and sent back home. What, what do we know today about the situation? I think it's very hard today to know what we don't know and to understand how to, under, how to read the information that we are being provided. Um, on the one hand, I think that the Chinese government is immensely successful in promoting a positive story of economic development in the Uyghur region, of this being a successful model of addressing um, so-called threats of terrorism, extremism, and separatism. Um, and they are doing this through their own media. They are doing this through diplomatic efforts. They are doing this through hosting visits to uh, the Uyghur region. They are doing this by working with scholars in the West who speak to their peers uh, and tell uh, a good Chinese story. Um, and I think that's, that's incredibly challenging to us to, to be able to combat that because for all of the reasons that David has spoken about and Abdulwali you've spoken about, that we, that we can't safely be in touch with understand what is happening on the ground, to be able to conduct research, to gather the evidence, um, takes incredible work and extraordinary courage. Um, and much of that burden is falling on, on the community themselves, the very people who are struggling the most because, as, as you know, Jory, you've said, 
this wasn't really meant to be your job. <laughs> um, and, and it has become that. Uh, and I think that that's, that's really you know, where organizations like us hope that we can support, hope that we can be providing that additional assistance to try to make clear what is happening. Um, but I think that despite the rhetoric that uh, the camps are closed, um, the best way I could describe it is actually a, another um, academic who has called it a cosmetic closure. The idea that many of the, um, the infrastructure that was built up, both the digital surveillance infrastructure and the physical infrastructure of camps, that has started to be slowly dismantled, um, but it's very much superficial. And the ability of people to travel, to, continue, to be in touch with their families, to understand what is happening um, with their communities back at home, that, that hasn't improved. That hasn't changed. And indeed, what we're seeing is, on the one hand, accounts of people being not in internment camps, but all of a sudden in jail, sentenced to 12 or 16 or 20 years um, with a closed uh, trial with very little access to lawyer or family um, and on charges which are entirely unclear. While at the same time, across the country, the Chinese government is rolling back efforts to build in transparency uh, about their judicial system. So we really find ourselves, I think, in a bit of a cat mouse game and where the best information we can have comes for many people and their families uh, at a an incredibly high cost. One of the most puzzling uh, aspects uh, is the fact that um, it, the international community is not really reacting to the scale of, of what's happening. And not only that, but we have this weird situation where the, the most Muslim countries, for example, vote with China at the UN Human Rights Council. Uh, and support China on the Uyghur question. Uh, the, 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 this battle every time about resolutions and the West comes with the 34 countries and then China comes with the 46. And the, uh, how do you explain that, that, that success of China of getting protection? I, I think it's important to consider both sides of the coin. So on the question of the, the success of China, um, I think that there um, is a lot, frankly, that um, the Chinese diplomatic efforts have been able to do because their interest in ensuring that the international human rights system or international media or human rights experts um, don't scrutinize their behaviors and practices domestically is precisely the same interest of many governments that are actively engaged in human rights violations, not least of which I think some that have been, been raised earlier in this discussion. Um, so I think there's a, a bit of a you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours scenario going on. Um, in other cases, I think we also have to be honest that for uh, governments that are looking at trade relations that are looking at how they can develop and compete, that are looking at Chinese um, political and economic backing that comes effectively with you know, no strings attached, that can be very hard to say no to. Um, and one thing that the Chinese government is very clear about is that there is, there is no gray area, there is no compromise. Um, you are either constructive or you are anti-China. Um, and I think the idea of having sort of a mature dialogue with differences, um, certainly uh, with, with this government now, is, is effectively off the table. Uh, but the second point, I think, you know, it, it is about how China can, can rally the troops, as it were. Um, but I think it's, it's also important to say that there, there is a real challenge in getting the global north, in getting the rest of us to, to pay attention and to be the kind of um, witnesses of, of what we are seeing. Um, and actually, Jor, as we were watching this, I remembered that you were here in 2016, uh, actually just up the road from us when the Martin Ennals Award Foundation gave their laureate prize to Ilham Toti. And at that time, 
the chair of the committee said that you know what Ilham Toti was was representing, what he was calling for, was precisely that which would enable a safe, secure, strong China. It was multi-ethnic, it was integration, it was dialogue between the communities. Um, and this, again, was before the camps came into place. It was before we started to see massive family separation. It was before we started to see the crackdown that we have. And I, I kind of reflected on that, George, as, as one more instance where we probably should have known what might have been coming down the road. And we probably should have thought more about, as a community, uh, an international community committed to protecting human rights, what, what we could have done better. Thank you. Uh, Juhar, I'm coming back to you. Y you mentioned you were working in labor issues, and, and forced labor is one of the uh, issues uh, dealing with the Xinjiang situation. Uh, how, how do you think uh, the West, uh, which is buying a lot from China, producing even sometimes locally, like Volkswagen, for example, um, uh, how do you think this could be an effective way of um, uh, of weighing on on the situation in Xinjiang? I believe we can treat it um, uh, for people can't really comprehend how their purchasing power could really affect a political decision of a nation. Let's break it down as a mathematic question. So. The Chinese government has a huge budget every year for so-called Wei Wen, which is maintaining social stability, which includes the mass destruction in the Uyghur region and um, their uh, control in Tibet and towards Chinese Christians and, and human rights defenders in, in China, uh, including Chinese human rights lawyers. So let's say all these massive budgets that are contributed to, you know, those, um, let's put it straight, human rights abuses. Where do the money come from? And the Chinese, the Chinese government um, has been panicking over its economy being declining recently. Well, whether it's the pandemic or because of the sanctions that's proposed in the Western countries. Well, and also um, the Chinese population have this, in a more general way, are very dissatisfied by the Chinese government's ruling over the past few years. So how do Chinese government uh, you know, uh, balance that. They usually, it's like, okay, if you give up on your human rights, I give you stability. You, you know, you can, uh, you can be able to earn enough to provide for a family, and you, you, you have, you know, all these. Um, uh, um, they call it xiao kang shui hui, which is like a, um, 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 almost like a middle class uh, uh, family uh, um, a standard that you, you'll be guaranteed if you give up all, all your rights for questioning your voting or, or, or freedom of expression. So it's like a, it's like a, a um, if you forgive one, uh, forget one, you get the other one. But now China cannot, uh, uh, China cannot guarantee jobs or the so-called middle class standard for their people and cannot guarantee the human rights to be granted to people. People do not have the voting rights people do not have the freedom of expression so china is really at a stage where they are be feeling threatened so they're desperately trying to gain back all the businesses from international um, you know uh, corporations so another math question is the chinese government throwing are throwing in massive millions of billions of yuan into building or maintaining those uh deten detention uh, systems, whether we're talking about the detention facilities or the camera, the surveillance system, or just to hire thousands of thousands of uh, police or authorities to be able to control people's flows. Those are massive budget every year. And the for Chinese government to be able to maintain it for longer is to be able to have enough budget to maintain that and to be able to profit off the current practices, which the forced labor really come into come into place. The Chinese government really be able to profit off those free or extremely cheap labors by putting Uyghur people into whether we're talking labor transfers or local, uh, you know, forced labor uh, f facilities. So we know that China has had a reputation before the all the genocide talk has happened. We know that China has had a long history of prison labors as well. So all these really help China with maintaining the functionality of locking up all these people into prison. And same thing with 
those uh, eradication centers, those uh, forced labor uh, practices, is to all these massive costs are being, uh, you know, um, they have a, f they're being fed with, with putting people into forced labor conditions. So how do we make China to not uh, profit off these practices, which, which, how do we do it? Well, if we have no orders coming out from from a uh, global south or from 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 the Western world, then the China then Chinese government will have to only sustain themselves by orders within China. But then there are enough Chinese workers who have been working in factories that can self fulfill the needs that's being proposed within China, and the Uyghur people are only being uh, brought in to work on the extra orders that could be coming in from the from the international corporations. So if international corporations no longer, if they exit the Uyghur region at every level of their supply chains, if there's no orders, if there's no needs, then slowly the Chinese government will have to, it will cost them more to having to maintain all these millions of people into those detention facilities or to maintain the, uh, the, the facilities from running. So slowly the Chinese government will have to, a simple math question, will have to let go of those um, uh, people who are being locked up because China is uh, in a problem of ha having to s provide jobs for all the Chinese people, I'm not talking about the Uyghurs, all the Chinese people who are jobless and who are willing to work in factories and being provided you know, health insurance and um, a normal wages. But Uyghur people are the ones who have to be forced to be removed out of their or original position and work in factories under uh, working in conditions strongly indicate forced labor, either not paid or paid way below minimum wage, have not do not have the choice to leave, do not have the choice to go home, do not have the choice to be able to reunite with their families and working in conditions that they're well, working for uh, more than 16 hours um, and uh, in high uh, strong Florence, uh, Florence lights that really destruct their physical health in the long term. So international community really consider when we are purchasing something, where do the money goes? And how are these money are going to contribute to the condition of the Uber people? I think that's a question we need to think about. 85% of the Chinese cotton is from the Uyghur region, which uh, contributes to 22% of global cotton output. 10% of the global aluminum products is sourced from the Uyghur region. Over 10% of the PVC, which makes floorings and, and walls, 10% of the world, global uh, PVC is from the Uyghur region. And we're talking about tomatoes and other synthetic fibers, um, communications uh, technologies. All these have been sourced from the Uyghur region and are really... It's actually very scary and concerning that the world is such heavily relying on that one small region. And we should be really rethinking whether we should be uh, repurpose uh, our supply chain. And our supply chain is pretty strong enough to be able to, you know, uh, a source to elsewhere in a place that is human rights more friendly and more sustainable. And also, I forgot to mention solar. Solar, it's a... Uh, uh, you know, environmental, I'm sure there are environmentalists that are sitting in the audience as well. And people say, okay, how do we battle the environment and human rights? Just uh, a reminder, over 30 pi or 35% of the solar is uh, polysilicon, which is a key material for solar industry, making solar uh, solar panels are sourced from the Uyghur region, world 35. And that's an insane amount of number. But does that mean it's better for the environment? No. Because in China, in the Uyghur region, all the polysilicon, for it to be made, it's to buy burning coal. It's actually worse for the environment. So if something is not environment friendly and not human rights friendly, maybe we should start thinking of other ways. Um, and we should be thinking, how do we smartly, more ethically to spend our money? And, um, and how do we really contribute to make Uyghur people's lives really better? Thank you. Uh, Abdulli, uh, what, in your advocacy, in your contacts with uh, governments, particularly in Europe, what, what do you see as the main obstacle for more commitment or more uh, action? Uh, is it lack of information? Is it, you know, Chinese market uh, 
uh, too big? Uh, what do you see as the main reason? I think the main reason is uh, the money issue. Like, uh, I don't believe they don't know it. They know very clearly, like, um, when we have a private conversation, they can tell me more than I know. Actually, they know. But uh, when we talk about money, it's different story. Like, let me make one example that uh, the city uh, where I was living, I, I'm living still, uh, Bergen, like Bergen Univers University imported the solar panel from J Solar Company. The company enlisted 2019 by the United States as a complicit with the uh, Uyghur forced labor. And 2022, still, Norwegian, uh, like the Bergen University imported the solar panel and they signed a 10 years contract. This is the first and second. Like uh, the, I have an office in Bergen Public Library and Bergen Public Library, they installed Hikvision camera. It is the camera installed the concentration camp. Like even I'm working so hard, like the city I'm living, they installed those cameras. The reason is it's cheap. <laughs> That's the reason. The main reason is this. I don't believe they don't know it. After like uh, I talk to the media, but the camera is still there. Not only in Bergen, the Norway uh, public library system, they installed Hick vision everywhere. It's the money issue. Like, yeah, we are talking, but the guys are talking behind. Different story. It's the main obstacle. Thank you. Mm, thank you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's very, very telling. Uh, Sarah, uh, we're also trying to find solutions. What would you uh, recommend also as individuals, as citizens, as consumers, as uh, voters uh, to, to do to change anything in this gloomy um, situation? I think we might need more than our remaining few minutes to, to answer that question fully. Um, but I wanted to say a few things. I mean, to, to Abdulwali, your point, the information is there. Um, and truly, there are individuals in this room there are people sitting in offices ac across the city um, who have done an incredible job of accepting information, of documenting abuses, of trying to engage with the Chinese government to get answers. Um, and I think, you know, whether that's people in civil society organizations, in a very small handful of businesses, uh, in the United Nations institutions, um, I think that they have done an incredible job of, of trying to give us enough that we should be able to act, that we should not need to um, find excuses or to say, well, but maybe, Maybe it's not right just yet, or maybe we need to think about this another way. Um, and and so, you know, if we look at last year, the the publication, well, two years ago now, the publication um, by the Office of the High Commissioner of an assessment report on the human rights situation in Xinjiang, that document, many people wished could have been much more than it was, but for. Those of us um, who have worked with the UN, who know what it is capable of, it had incredible potential and it told us exactly what we needed to know, which is that on the basis of information that the UN had collected, they deemed it likely that the Chinese government was committing international crimes, including crimes against humanity. The challenge has become, I think, whether it is political expediency or economic pressure, that taking action on that at the level of member states of the UN has become an almost insurmountable challenge. Um, does that necessarily, in the very immediate term, mean that um, if there was a resolution in the Human Rights Council tomorrow, we would see a change for Uyghurs on the ground? I don't think so. But I think it shows us that it is possible to speak truth to the powers, to the Chinese government. It is possible to hold them accountable in the same way that this system should be able to hold anyone accountable. 
Um, and it shows the communities and the family members and people who set aside human rights. This is purely about a humanitarian. Do you know where your mother or sister or daughter is? Um, it tells them that their lives, that what they are fighting for and what they've given up to do so is, is being seen. And I think that has an incredible power. Um, so for each of us, we can uh, sign petitions, we can speak up, we can ask our elected leaders to push our governments to make this a priority, to ensure that their discussions with China are not uh, carried by the economic discussions of the day, but that very much keep human rights and individuals in China and in our societies here, like Abdulwali, like the communities you guys were working with in Turkey, that keep them and, and their rights really at the center. Thank you. Before turning to your questions, uh, just the last word, uh, David, is what, what's going to be the life of your film? Uh, where are you going to show it? How can it influence and, and uh, you know, go in the direction that we've been? Part of this is an answer to your previous question, something that Sarah didn't hit yet. What can people do? Um, one thing people can do is spread the word about this film and get people to go to our website and to be on our mailing list so that we can, we're gonna be organizing screenings everywhere we can get an audience. And so if you have friends, not just here in Geneva, but elsewhere in the world, people who you think might be advocates, people who would be interested in learning about this, then we can increase the number of people out there in the world who are witnessing. And I think that's the most important thing. That's what the film is about. There's no white Western voices in this film. This is a film of witnessing and that was very important to us, and I think that's its greatest strength. Um, so that's one thing people can do. Of course, um, along with that is, is start to really watch your shopping. There's all kinds of apps that you can drop onto your browsers if you're shopping online that are going to tell you if, if a site you have gone to um, likely is sourcing goods from forced labor. Um, I'm not going to say which brands are there and which brands are not there, but I'm sure uh, <laughs> I'm looking at you, Johar, and laughing. I'm sure Johar would be happy to. <laughs> um, but you can you can you can find this out very very easily. It was something else we didn't want to put in the film. We wanted to put in more, you know, the personal stories and have you witness. But all of this detailed information and the history of the region and what's actually been going on, you can find all of this out online very very easily. Um, it's all out there. Thank you. So. Questions, uh, I can, uh, um, there are microphones, okay, here. Um, the filmmaker of the film Photophobia just went by accident, he went to uh, Ukraine to do something different and he ended up having to go in underground to protect himself from the bombing. And because he lived with the people in the metro for a few days, he became friends, ended up making the film and says that he became an activist. And it makes me think about how everybody can become an activist. So now he's dedicated to that. And I think everybody who's sitting here can, je sais pas s'il y a des gens qui comprennent pas l'anglais? No? It's okay, that's uh, So yeah, yeah. everybody in here can become an activist. And you can, we, sh we have to act with our shopping. We have to act when we vote. We have to bring our towns our governments to account. We we are the people who have to stop this because Sorry. at the higher level Sorry. they all speak to each other. Uh, can can you make short interventions so more people can? My I have one question, which is the um, Chinese government has been creating these uh, offices in different countries where they survey they have surveillance. So what is the situation for you people regarding this Chinese new policing in different countries? Um, you want to answer? Okay, uh, let me answer the question. Like, uh, yes, there are uh, different uh, countries. There are Chinese secret uh, police stations and uh, Chinese secret organization. But there's something uh, like more than that. Like, uh, actually, China, it's a digital empire. Like, uh, almost 90% um, of Chinese, they have uh, WeChat. It's a Chinese app. And you can buy a ticket and you can do everything uh, with the WeChat. And at the same time, uh, like uh, it is a spying app on your phone and wherever you go and you like uh, it uh, follows you 
And then uh, like uh, you have to uh, download that app to communicate with your family members in China. And it means that you are 24 hours under control by Chinese government. That's why we have 90%, maybe 95% of majority of Chinese around the world keep silence what's happening there. So like, yes, there are. Uh, it's uh, reported different uh, Chinese secret police stations, but the more dangerous thing is Chinese digital empire, Chinese digital uh, prison around the world, because they are, the prison is in our app, in your cell phone, in your pocket. That's why we don't have enough voice around the world, because of everyone afraid of talking, because of they have cell phone and they have to communicate with their family. And Chinese government cannot uh, allow the people to install WhatsApp signal or something else. The only one is WeChat. That's the connection between, the week, between people outside and the inside. How people speak up. That's the reason. Thank you. Yes. Yes, um, this was such a necessary film to make, and I really we thank the uh, producer and also the activists and actors. Um, after all, this uh, repression has been going on for 14 years, and this is the f uh, this is the first um, documentary I've seen on it. And uh, no government that commits human rights violations actually likes to be in the limelight, spotlight. In fact, their mission is to deny it, as we've heard, you know. So, I mean, uh, the main issue here is, is to avoid declining world global interest in the problematic. So that's where the documentary uh, comes very, is very useful. Um, well, a general question, can this monstrous project succeed? I mean, can one eradicate, eradicate the ethnic identity of a whole peoples with this, this scheme? I mean, it's been going on for 10 years, right? And how many, how many, how much longer does it need to go on for? Uh, will it go on for? That's question number one. Two is what is the diaspora, the Uyghur diaspora? How many um, Uyghurs live abroad? And in which country are they the most numerous? Um, and have any government, has any government openly condemned the, the, the Chinese action, I mean, come forth. And one government that sort of strikes me is the Turkish government, which uh, after all, they, one would expect that they would maybe have been more forthright in, in standing up for their fellow ethnic community, let's say. And I wondered if Mr. Ayub could comment on that since he lived in, 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 in Istanbul. And why did he leave Istanbul? I was curious. Thank you. So let, let's start with Joar. Maybe she can answer the first part of your question. Can it succeed? Uh, just to clarify, uh, if your question was whether the Chinese government scheme can succeed in eliminating Uyghur's I, identity. I think that's that, what I understood, yes. Did I understand yes. correctly? Yes. Um, if it continues long enough, it could. Uh, if you look at many ethnic groups in China, there are, to for people who are not familiar, there are a total of 56 um, ethnic groups in China, well, including Han Chinese, but only about 10 of them or 15 of them have remained its own original culture or languages. And all the rest of the 40-some-ish uh, uh, ethnic groups have completely successfully uh, uh, assimilated to Han Chinese, whether from their looks to their language to their culture. And that is, and it took many, many years uh, gradually. I mean, those ethnic groups have a smaller population and therefore um, it was relatively easier for the Chinese government to assimilate them. And um, a lot of those groups were not religious groups, but like groups, uh, uh, for groups like Tibetans and Uyghurs and Kazakhs and Kyrgyz, we are religious groups that have unique culture and language. We have been fighting hard to preserve it. However, with this such uh, systemic uh, efforts in removing our identity, it could work and we could eventually end up becoming like, sadly, like inner Mongolians. Um, uh, inner Mongolia, uh, you know, Mongolians used to be, uh, have a pretty predominant history, a, a predominant space in the history, but Inner Mongolians that you see, the uh, many of whom who have left lost their culture and language, and eventually Uyghur people 
and Tibetans and Cossacks and Kyrgyz, we could be next and if this continues long enough. And, um, and uh, but we could prevent this if we can stop the Chinese government from continuing its crackdown on Uyghurs. And also Uyghurs overseas are trying everything they can to preserve culture and language. I have to admit, um, embarrassingly, embarrassingly admit that I did not speak my mother tongue before coming to the U.S. because I was born and raised in Beijing and I wasn't allowed to study it at school. I learned mother tongue at Indiana University, in an American university. I learned, I took classes and I learned. So now I know how to speak, I know how to read and write, and I can understand, although not like in an academic way. Um, but we were like me, we're trying everything we can to, 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 you know, to maintain our culture. I fasted and uh, observed the Ramadan for the first time in my life after coming to the US. My first year, that was my first time stepping into a mosque my first time touching a Quran and I have been di- doing that every single year now nonstop, which I was I didn't get the opportunity when I was in China. And yeah, we were like me are fighting for for our preserving our, you know, uh, rights for um, practicing our religion and maintaining our culture in every way we can. And I hope you can join us. You know, uh, some uh, some countries, they have the museum for for Tibetans or memorial uh, temple for for this group or that group, but we haven't had one for Uyghurs yet. But with your help, maybe we can build the next one could be in Geneva. The other one could be in Berlin and the other one could be in Paris. And and if we can slowly have more and more around the world to make people remember Uyghurs are unique individuals who are beautiful people that love our culture and love being who we are. And I hope you can join us with this. And um, also, uh, I, can I just get back to earlier when um, someone asked about the, what we can do? Yes, um, you could, talk, if you're from a university, you could talk to your university and ask to add the Uyghur subject to the curriculum, to the syllabus. I think this is a very important way because education is key in building the mindset of human rights is important. And without without even knowledge of who the Uyghurs are and the condition and political or economic condition of the Uyghur region, how can people start acting upon it? So we need to first raise awareness from the younger generation, whether we're in high school or college, we need to start doing that. You know, we start from early, then people will grow, grow up to learn to think of Uyghurs just like every other human beings, not some groups from remote area that is so far away from us that's not related to us. Thank you. You want to take the, the Turkish uh, okay. question? Yeah, let me answer this question as well, because um, like I uh, recently uh, interviewed uh, 11 Uyghurs just came uh, from China, and uh, all of them not came directly from East Turkestan, they came from Chinese provinces, like Sichuan or somewhere. And uh, from my documentation, I learned that like uh, the surveillance already uh, internalized. Like uh, uh, people now, they don't mention their Uyghurness. Like uh, they don't mention we are Uyghur, they just we. There's no Uyghur that word. They don't call their language Uyghur and they don't like uh, say uh, God. And they, but when we like uh, say goodbye, we said the Khudai Muhammad, it's a God bless you something. And people don't say that. And people like, uh, they don't uh, uh, hold uh, the ceremony for wedding, just hold Chinese ceremony. They're not Chinese government asking them to do that, but they already started to do that. It's already, I interviewed those people. And then like the people now, they don't uh, call their kids to speak Uyghur to them because they know that everyone almost, they have a cell phone and they have that app, um, Sky, like it's a Jingwang, it's a pure net app they have to install and the app uh, is surveilling them, not Chinese camera, not, not the camp now, the app. Then they like, when they talk to uh, kids in Uyghur, the app will remind them what you are doing. So like uh, now, like no, like it's Chinese government is right. Like we are not asking people to speak Chinese, but they speaking Chinese because of it's safe. That's uh, like a new uh, finding. Another about that uh, like uh, Turkish uh, example. Um, we love the people. Like uh, mention Muslim, Turkish. 
it's okay. We love the people, but the government is a different story because government is cooperating with China and like in, in Turkey as well in like other Muslim states, the media are controlled by the government. And even I went to Central Asia in, uh, in 2022, September, even the Uyghur uh, in third generation, they asked me that, is it true? American propaganda or it's true? I said, if I am the true, that is true. <laughs> if I am fake, that's fake. Look, even Uyghurs in living in, like in uh, Uzbekistan, the third generation, they are hesitating <laughs> to believe what's happening there. How can we convince the people who are nothing to do with Uyghur, the Turkish or other Muslim states? Because of the state always propagates something what Chinese government asked to do. And they don't, they don't have a chance. They don't have access to the real story. Like, we can't even, uh, we applied for Kazakh film festival. We can't. We can't screen our film in Kazakhstan or in Muslim states. How can we tell the truth? So, like, I think people are innocent. I don't believe they don't, like, uh, care because of they don't know, I think. The another that, like, uh, Turkey, after the Erdogan, it's a different story, like, uh, became dictator. And like in Turkey, there is no, we cannot say there is no, there's very few free media. And uh, I don't believe like people know what's happening and people really understand what's happening. And um, so, um, yeah, like uh, the, the Turkish uh, current state always um, claim that they are with the Muslim brother or something like that, but it's just fooling their people, just fooling their votes. That's the reason. Mm. We have time for one more question. Um, front, first row. Thank you. Well, amazing film. First, congratulations, uh, David, and my good friend, uh, uh, Ayub and uh, Jawher. So I heard this uh, about the film, but it is my first time. I just came from Germany to watch the film today. So very touching. Uh, very uh, impressive. So I'm also part of this story because my mother died concentration camp. My two brother is a uh, jail in the concentration camp. Even today, I have no news since 2017. So sometimes we are doing advocacy around the world every day. But sometimes one picture, one five-minute uh, documentary or film is more effective than 100 hours speaking to the people. So that's why. Uh, you did amazing job. Thank you so much on behalf of the Uyghur people. And my question to you, do you have any planning to one more or two or three of them? Because, <laughs> yes, on this, because it's, you describe only very small part of the Uyghurs have been faced today. A lot of topic. Million Uyghur children separate from family, boarding school, forced labor, Jeff had already talking about on this issue. Refugee case today, at least 10, 15,000 Uyghurs waiting for safe country today in Turkey, Central Asia. So a lot of topic. We are really help you if you uh, <laughs> have a such idea. Thank you. <laughs> so it's good. I'll meet you back there afterwards. Yes. <laughs> Speak to my producer. <laughs> Okay, one, one more, so a hand somewhere, yes. Okay, the la you're going to be the last, I promise. And Turkey is the country with the most Uyghurs outside of the region, to answer your question. Thank you very much uh, for this very important uh, movie. My question is uh, how important uh, the colonial question is, uh, how much important it is to frame this story as a colonial story, and uh, how do you feel when you hear the word Xinjiang uh, to describe your region? And what does this word mean? Thank you. It's a good question. Thank you. Let me ask, answer this question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> because it's my question. No, go ahead. <laughs> I'm useless anyway. <laughs> um, the Xinjiang, this term, uh, according to Chinese dictionary published in uh, uh, 1893, uh, it's Xinjiang, it means new colony. It's written really clearly in the dictionary. In Chinese English dictionary, 
Xinjiang, in the English explanation, new colony. This is the like Xinjiang is is colonial place, and the Chinese uh, Empire colonized uh, Uyghur homeland, and then they call it Xinjiang, new territory, new colony, and then yeah, like. Uh, in the world, uh, already like this colonization, we have some uh, agreement around the world, but it didn't implement it. Some countries, especially China, like Tibet and uh, and Uyghur and like um, Mongol, also living under this colonial regime. Uh, I hope it will end at the end. Yeah, thank you. Sarah, you wanted to say a word. Yeah, I, I wanted to come in maybe with two two quick points. Um, one, I noticed as I was coming in on the tram that there is an exhibition on El Mayar at the Rathaus. Um, and if uh, any of you know who she was, so a Swiss um, woman adventurer, author, um, the first time I read a book by her was actually her story of going from Beijing to Kashgar. Um, and I would, I would really recommend you read it because it shows how up until as late as the 20s, 30s, this was, a, this was not China in the way that we understand it. And I think it's, it's a really important historical reminder uh, of that. The second point I wanted to make was, was to, to this question around colonialism um, and a comment that when you know, organizations like ours and, and um, you know, people who sort of look at how China acts in the UN and the way that the, the foreign ministry speaks, there is a very clear desire to cast themselves as post-colonial or anti-colonial, that they are sort of one with uh, the global south, with the G77, um, and very much in opposition to the global west. Um, this is increasingly um, apparent in their laws and regulations, not just in their rhetoric. Um, but I think it's incredibly important to remember that that is, that is a, a very carefully crafted narrative. Um, and it is one which is incredibly um, powerful for them to be able to mobilize in terms of gaining political support. But it is not at all a narrative which is uncontested by many in China and in surrounding countries and regions, whether we're talking about Uyghurs or Tibetans uh, or Hong Kong, where colonial era legislation wasn't used from 1967 until 2020, when the Beijing imposed national security law created an environment where, for the first time in 50 years, sedition um, was, the, was, was now a crime and used to target critics. So I think that's a really important piece of this discussion around colonialism that, that I personally think we should be doing a better job also of, of pulling out. Thank you. Unfortunately, time uh, is running out. Thank you, Joar. It was uh, great to have you with us. And thank you, the three of you. Thank you. Thank you.